morning, good morning, ladies. Oh boy. <laughs> We're starting off. Uh, okay. Yeah. How about this? Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, well, tonight we wind down before we crank it up for um, the holidays, the Christmas season, which is such a blessing. So, uh, first off, I just want to let you know on your tables are these booklets. And they came to us from um, the couple, if you were here on Sunday, that shared, that are with Wycliffe Bible Translators. And this is um, conversations with central, women in Central Asia and how to pray for them. So you each have one of these. And if there's someone you feel like you want to take it to, please feel free to take more than one. Um, so just thought I'd let you know about that. And tonight, um, did anybody, was anybody singing that song this week? If you want to be great. No, just me? Okay. Anybody? <laughs> Learn to be the servant of all. And did anybody have this question? How? You know, if anybody wishes to um, be great in the kingdom of God, he must be a servant of all, and he must be like this child. How? Um, and I wrestled with that, and I've come to this conclusion. I can't. He has to do it in me. And so that becoming a child is the work that he does in us when we place our faith in him, when we understand that we are so needy that we can't bring anything to the table. That's a child. And then to be great, it's not that we seek greatness for ourselves, and we aren't even to be the servant of mankind, because remember in Matthew when they... When they stood before Jesus and he said, depart from me, I never knew you. But, 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 Lord, we did this and we did, we were serving, we were serving. So it's not that we're serving man, we become his servant. He becomes the Lord. And so we become great so that his name will be great. So um, it just was very freeing for me to think about. It's not something that I do, it's something that he does in me. And I have a feeling we'll hear, hear more about that this evening. And so I'm so excited um, to be here. And as you read on the bottom of the sheet, to go back and read. Don't leave this study for the month that we're not meeting together. Continue reading through this. Repetition, repetition, repetition is a great teaching tool. So let's pray, and we are excited to hear what God has given Karen to share with us this evening. Heavenly Father, we just say thank you. Thank you because you're so good, you're so worthy, you're so faithful. And Lord, anything that you call us to, you do the work in us. And Lord, so we thank you that by your Holy Spirit and through your Holy Word, that you conform us to the image of your Son so that you would be glorified. So Father, work in us. And during this season of thanksgiving and celebration of the birth of Christ, May we be ever mindful and ever grateful for what you have done and what you continue to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Caitlin. Well, I think after that, Sandy, you can just pray and go home, right? <laughs> <laughs> got, got, uh, got our lesson already. But uh, it, anyway, it is the last lesson for this fall, and I'm glad you're all here. And I want to start with a picture. How many know what that is? The moon. The moon landing, right? How many people remember it? Anybody? Yeah, we have some people who remember it. Uh, my dad, uh, when this was happening, I was a little kid, and he so he took pictures of the, the TV, of it actually happening. So we got these Polaroids of, of the actual uh, broadcast of it, and then he recorded the audio of it uh, from Walter Cronkite, you know, um, off of it he, as it was happening, and he had my brother and I speak our names, the date, and how old we were, uh -huh. were while it was happening. It was such a big deal. I mean, it was huge. That was the only thing that was happening was this whole focus on getting to the moon. But do you remember why getting them to the moon was so important? Do you remember that? Anybody? It wasn't just a sign. There you go, trying to beat the Russians. That's exactly it. It's because the Soviet Union put a man, a man in space first. They also put the first satellite in space. They put the first animal in space. And so we were trying to kind of play tech catch up. And, and so the whole drive to get to the moon was a race to be first. That was what it was. And so the history books record that 
Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were indeed the first people to step on the moon. Um, and so there's something about wanting to be first, right? I mean, that's a big deal. I mean, uh, you can see it in schoolyards, you can see it in corporate offices, you can see it in churches, and you can see it all the way up between the, con con uh, the competition between nations, like in this example. And when you come to Christianity, you think, well, I'm really not supposed to be trying to be first, right? But if you look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, he says that all runners run, but only one gets the prize. And then he exhorts us to run in such a way to get the prize. So it's not bad to want be want to be first and to run in order to get that prize so long as the goal is right. So today we're going to talk about that desire within us uh, and, uh, that wants to be first. It's really deep down inside of us, but we're going to talk about how you can really win. How you really can win in God's eyes, not just according to what the world says. And so today we're in the middle of Mark chapter 9, and our, this is our last session for the fall. And our, our last of four sessions on what it looks to be a, like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And let me bring you up to speed where we are in chapter 9. So we get a sense of what leads up to this passage because it does have a direct impact on what happens and so the first part of chapter 9 was all about the transfiguration, and we spent the whole time last time talking about that. And so you remember who's present, Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And uh, so they are coming down off the mountain after this amazing event where Jesus reveals himself, or he's, he's revealed as the Son of God in all his resplendent glory. And they come down and find the other disciples in an argument. They're in a big crowd, and they're having this argument, and, and, and so Jesus asks what's going on, and so um, uh, that leads us up to verse 17, where a man in the crowd answers, uh, and he talks about his son, who is, uh, um, he is uh, possessed by a spirit that robbed him of his speech, and then he gives an, uh, tells all about what happened to him, and then here's the point, he says, I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't do it, and so... He goes on, and Jesus talks to the, the dad, and he talks to him, and he's asking what, how long it's been happening. And he talks about it's been going on since he was a child, and that all of this terrible stuff had happened to him, that the, the spirit trying to kill him. Now, this is the dad that's exasperated. This is the dad that's lost hope because he has been trying to get his son some help for a very long time time and so he's now come to the disciples they can't do anything and now he turns to jesus and he says if you can do something take pity on us and help us and uh and jesus says if you if, if you can jesus says everything is possible for him who believes and then the dad exclaims um, i do believe help me overcome my belief now this is by the way a really great place to start in prayer with God, if you are struggling with something, you are struggling to understand why God allows something, or he hasn't allowed something, or he's just taking too long doing it, and we're, because the world will tell us, and the church will even tell us, it's your fault because you don't have enough faith. If you had enough faith, then you could, God would move on your behalf, so there's something wrong with you. But let me remind you that the scripture tells us that the faith to believe comes from God. You don't just work up something within you, and then God says, okay, now you've got it going, and then I'll respond to you. The faith to believe him is a gift from God himself. Now, of course, you have a part in that. God is never going to make anybody believe anything. It's a choice we make, but the source of faith is within him. And so when we struggle, we kind of need to do exactly what this God does here, right? He ex express our desire, express our struggle express your need ask it's not like you're hiding anything from god by not saying what you're really thinking right he already knows <laughs> i mean he knew before you were born how you were feeling at this moment and so uh, you know just speak up say god i want to believe this is really hard i'm struggling here i want to follow you but help me and help me overcome my unbelief help me trust you my goodness this is a great place to start now we could do a whole lesson on just this part right here but we don't have time so we're going to move on from there 
after Jesus heals this, uh, calls the evil spirit out, heals this boy, it brings us up to 33 and following where we were going to uh, going to stay. And what we see here is that there's some key character traits that he's going to talk to these disciples about and, and help them understand how they can become great in the kingdom of God. Now, remember that the kingdom of the world is backwards from the kingdom of God. And uh, basically... Everything that we've learned about how to get ahead in this world and be on top is flat wrong. Everything the world has taught us is backwards from what he says. And that's uh, the kingdom of the world is in opposition to the kingdom of God completely. Because the world tells us that we're graded on a curve, right? As long as your good outweighs your bad, you're, you're okay. God's going to accept you. But that's not the truth. The Bible says that none is righteous not even one. And all of our righteousness, all of our good works, apart from Christ, is like filthy rags. And the uh, people tells us that humility is weakness. Don't let people step on you. You need to look out for yourself. The Bible says those who humble themselves will be exalted. And, you know, the whole social media says, you know, look out for yourself. Put yourself first. Look out for number one. But Jesus tells us, put others first. And then the world, uh, everybody out there will tell you that this world, everything you can see with your eyes, that's all that matters. Invest now. Get all you can from this world. But the Bible says that there's a spiritual dimension out there that is much more real than what we can see with our eyes. And then it exhorts us to set our minds on things above, not on earthly things. So there's a lot more of these paradoxes in the Bible. Uh, and being great in the kingdom of God is no different. So we have to adjust our the way we look at it and not and try not to apply the world's view of things and to try to figure out how we can please God and follow Jesus. So after the boy is healed, they go on and travel some more. They go to Capernaum and we arrive where they were supposed to be in this house. And apparently there was this argument going on, this discussion going on in and around, maybe behind them, maybe they were lagging behind. And Jesus stops and looks at his disciples and says, so what were you arguing about, guys? <laughs> and they don't answer him because what they had been arguing about was who is the greatest. That's a big awkward moment, right? <laughs> and they're, so they're talking about who's, who's the greatest disciple. And you might imagine that maybe Peter, James, and John, after what happened with the transfiguration, are kind of going, no, what, it's us? It's us. We went with uh, Jairus to see his daughter raised from the dead. And we're kind of the inner circle. So maybe it's us. And you remember James and John, they argue about who can be left sit on the left and right. So they thought they had some, some skin in the game where they thought they were the best, maybe. Maybe it was even Judas. We know he speaks up later on. And maybe he says, hey, I'm CFO. You put me in charge of the money. Maybe I'm the greatest one. And we don't know what the conversation was like, but they are busted. <laughs> and, um, and they know they're wrong. And so Jesus calls them together. He's like, okay, guys, sit down and let's do a little attitude adjusting here. And from what he says to them is where we're going to get our, our lessons on what it means for us to be disciples. And we can learn some key characteristics, that is, of great true greatness in the kingdom of god and the first one that uh sandy alluded to is that we start with being a servant spirit and that's in verse 35 so he, they sat down and he says if you want to be, anyone wants to be first he must be very last and the servant of all so the wrong assumption that jesus is confronting here is uh to become first you got to serve right that's backwards because in our the way we look at it the way we looked at it back then is that leaders don't serve right leaders are people who have others serve them that is the higher up you are the more uh, prestige the more prominence the more money that you have the more people serve you that's the way it is in this life right presidents don't cook their own food uh, they don't carry out the trash. Kings and queens don't clear the table. CEOs don't show up and set up the boardroom before everybody comes in. Somebody else does that. Uh, back when Cliff and I were first married, we used to like to go to the Atlanta Street of Dreams. See back where that is? Uh, well, it was. Uh, they, uh, they would um, build these big, massive houses in these new uh, subdivisions. I mean. 
big house, like 2,700 square feet, huge houses. And then they would have decorators and people come in and then decorate them and then you could tour them and see all the new innovations and stuff. We used to like to do that before we had kids. <laughs> and I would always marvel at the fact that in these massive, massive houses, the laundry rooms were T90. They were like <laughs> in a closet. And I'm like, you know, so, you know, we built our house. I wanted a whole room for a, a, a laundry room, right? And we have four kids. I did a lot of laundry, a lot of laundry. So I want to be able to spread this stuff all out. Sometimes we do 18 loads in a week. It was just huge. And so, but I, so I told him, I said, that's because people who live in these houses don't do their own laundry, right? <laughs> I mean, they haven't got to send it out or they have somebody come in and do it. So they don't even think, oh, I might need a big laundry room because I'm going to do a lot of laundry. But no, that, that's kind of it. And so Jesus steps in and says, no, 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 no. That's not the way it is. To be great means serving others. Now, he didn't just lay down a new rule here and say, here, follow this rule, you guys. What he did was where from beginning to the end of his time on earth, he demonstrated it. And you might first think, oh, yeah, I remember that thing where he washed the feet. Yeah, that was part of it. But there was a back end even further than that. And, and here we see his immense humility even coming to the earth to begin with, right? We're so used to the thought of Jesus the man, but just marvel for a minute the fact that God, who created the whole world, who can do anything, who knows everything, who holds it all together uh, with no effort at all, he condescended to come to this earth to be born into the world and to be laid in a feeding trough and some of you are probably about ready to pull out your manger scene set it up on the mantel or on the table wherever you can look at it during the holidays and uh but this idyllic scene that we have and if we're sitting up on our mantles there's not what it was really like i mean how many of you have been in and around a real real barn yard and a real farm for any time you grow up on it okay it is not pretty <laughs> it's not nice, it's dirty, it smells, there's flies, there's insects, and there's stuff on your feet all the time, especially in the feeding areas, right? And uh, I can remember when I was growing up, my mom and dad both grew up on working farms, and I, I spent my childhood at this working farm, and my, my cousin and I, we used to love to play in the farm, but that's not pretty. <laughs> it's not, and think about you kids, I mean, you people who have little kids right now in the sanitized world we live in can you imagine laying your newborn child in an animal feeding trough i mean where they chew up stuff and spit it out can you imagine just laying this newborn child in there and remember and mary it says in luke that she wrapped him in swaddling clothes that's all poetic and everything right it's just rags she didn't have a proper blanket for him so she found whatever she could ripped it up and wrapped the Son of God in dirty rags. It's, it, is, it is not a romantic scene, but, uh, it, but it is in this place of dirt and grime and poverty comes the Son of God, the exalted one, the one with all power, all glory, all majesty. We just saw him reveal himself in the transfiguration. That's who came in this in this uh, speeding trough. Talk about humility. Wow. <laughs> the very thought of it, it is overwhelming when we start to take it in. And then talk about the back half of his life. We all know Philippians 2, verse 6 and 8, which tells us that he was God, but didn't grasp that and say, hey, I'm God, worship me. He, he made himself nothing, took the form of a servant, made in human likeness, humbled himself, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The most humiliating, painful, horrendous form of death that existed, I'd say then or now, complete humility to serve and to save us. Greatness means we need to adopt a similar attitude. And others comes first. Not just the people that we like, not the, just the people who we get along with, not just the people who we were, are nice to us first. Whoever they are, we are the most like Jesus to those when we are kind and serve those who aren't nice to us. I mean, people who, and people, 
when we do that, it gets people's attention because it's so opposite of what the world does. It is unusual, but that is a mark of true discipleship. In fact, Jesus tells us this very thing in Luke chapter 6. He says, if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is it to you? Even sinners do that. He would say, you are nice to the people who are nice to you? Big, fat, hairy deal, okay? I mean, everyone does that. It takes no faith. It takes no spiritual insight. It, no, it takes no power of the Holy Spirit to do that. It's just what everybody does. And then he goes on to, he says, verse 35, love your enemies. Do good to them. And then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind, the ungrateful, and wicked. Now, that's us, people. All of us are the ungrateful and wicked. He is kind to us first. Be merciful just as your Father in heaven is merciful. And so he says, love those who hate you, who persecute you, and serve them and show mercy to them. Uh, and even those who are outright mean. That is so opposite of what the world does, especially today, who tell you, you have got your own rights. Stand up for yourself. Don't let them do that to you. That's not what you, God says. He says when we do that, the opposite of that, we show the character of our Heavenly Father. And because isn't that what Jesus did for us? While we were yet center, sinners, rebels, renegades, insurrectionists in his kingdom, Christ came and served us. He said, go and do likewise. So, start with the servant spirit. Then we go on. Uh, greatness in the kingdom of God is receptive. Verse 36 and 37, he talks about the little child. He brings him and stands among them. And he says, whoever welcomes one of these, uh, the little children my, in my name welcomes me. So the disciples were squabbling over status. Who's the greatest? Who's the best? And, but this child that he brought and put in front of them represented the marginalized people of society that no one cared about. So in this day and age, a child in this society had no rights at all. No laws protected them. They were property of their father, and he could do as they pleased, as he pleased, up to putting them out of the house, having them stoned, uh, all, you know, that, all these kinds of things. So the children had no ability to improve their rank or how people saw them at all. In fact, it would be highly unusual for a grown adult man to pay attention to any child other than his own, and very unusual for a child to be allowed in the presence of a, of a respected rabbi. And we see this before where uh, the children try to come to Jesus in another passage, and the disciples say, go away, that you can't come near him, and because that was normal. That was normal in this society, but he says, come to me. And here in this passage, he just doesn't bring this kid over as a object lesson. I love that he says that he put, took him in his arms. That's an expression of compassion and of love. So what's the application for this passage for us? Because children really aren't marginalized in our society today. They're very well uh, covered by laws, much more so than, than here. So how can we apply it? Well, when we welcome and when we embrace and include those who are in any way in positions to help us or to elevate our status, then we're showing real love like Jesus does. Um, that's because we all generally gravitate toward people who we like, people who we respect, and who, people who we want to be associated with, and, or people who have things that we want. Um, and I remember we went to this uh, other church years and years ago, and there was this guy who was sitting near us and um, in the greeting time, you know, he's like, hi, and he's talking to Cliff, and he's, you know, he's like, hey, you know, why don't we get together and have lunch, and you know, all that kind of stuff, and, and, and pretty soon, he was a pyramid scheme guy, right, he was like, I want you to come in on, under, under me, and you sell this, and whatever, and when Cliff said, you know, I'm not interested in that kind of thing at all, he never heard from him again, <laughs> right, he didn't want to be friends with Cliff, he was looking at Cliff as how Cliff could benefit him, and Jesus is like, don't do that, don't do that. <laughs> it's like, um, don't look at what people can do for you. Find someone who can't give you back anything and serve them. When we do that out of love for God, then the reward is we don't get a reward by what they can give us. We get the reward from our Father, and that is we're drawn closer to Him, and our relationship with Him is deepened. And so, uh, and so, 
Oops, get the page. Sorry. Yeah, we just, um, so if we remember back to uh, the next thing is, uh, there's receptive, and that is, uh, I'm sorry, free from jealousy. True greatness in the kingdom of God is free from jealousy, verses 38 to 41. And so you remember back to, uh, to verse 18, and we just read, the disciples are arguing about with this crowd of fo folks over casting out a demon from a boy, and, and they couldn't do it. And so here we see in verse 38, here's a guy who is driving out demons in his name, and they don't like it because he's not part of their group. So there's jealousy going on here. And so this happens a lot, right? We see somebody succeed where we fail, and we get jealous. Or somebody else is doing something in a church or in ministry and isn't happening in our group, and we start questioning, oh, I don't know if the sincerity is right, and they might be off and all this kind of stuff. You see this happening in the church all the time, and instead of being glad about the success of another ministry, then we get upset, and we want to stop them. And this happens on social media all the time. Christians chiding other Christians and name-calling. It is embarrassing, and it's a terrible witness to the world. Jesus calls us, calls us to be unified. We're supposed to be examples of the unity in the body, and goodness gracious, it's embarrassing. And uh, so look what he says in verse uh, 41 here. I'm sorry, 39. He says, don't stop him. He says, anybody who's for us is not against us. Whoever is not against us is for us. That's what Jesus is saying here. So we should never feel like, especially in the body, that we have a corner market on ministry of any kind. That we're just, we're the only ones doing it the right way. See, God blesses people with incredible creativity. Creativity. Because this person here, that person there gives them a great idea and they'll reach this particular group better. But those things are not better or worse than what another group is, is doing. It's just different. And I tell my kids this all the time. Different doesn't mean bad. Different just means different. And what works one place doesn't work another place. And you can see this internationally. Uh, for sure. So if you took something that worked really well in China or in Africa or in the Far East or in Russia and tried to bring it here, it wouldn't work. And vice versa. If we took what we did here and tried to put it there, it wouldn't work. So, so we need to realize that God reaches people in all kinds of different ways. Now, what's the exception? He says here in verse 39, he says, the line of accepting everything is in my name. No one who does a miracle or in my name can say the next moment anything bad about me. So now, in my, what does in my name mean? That's a really important part of this. Does it mean that everyone who paints the name of Jesus on something is doing it in his name? Okay? It means in accordance with his will, in line with his character, and with his focus. So it takes some discernment to know uh, because some things that look like Jesus are not Jesus at all. But if we don't know and we're not familiar with who Jesus is, what he does, the, uh, then we don't know. We're like, yeah, I don't know. That looks pretty good. And it can be way off. So the, in, in big gatherings, don't necessarily mean that it's being that God is blessing it. There's a lot of charismatic people out there that can get a big following. has nothing to do with Jesus. Way off track. See that all over the place. But uh, the responsibility for us as believers is to be discerning. Uh, uh, and we have to know what the truth is as it is written. The scriptures are what guide us. This isn't our opinion about a subject. It isn't how you feel about it. It's not your preference. Uh, because what you what you like or don't like something doesn't make it biblical or not. It's what's written in the scripture. Scripture traditions and fondness for things can be wrong. It's like if you know anything about the Protestant Reformation, this is what happens. That the church, the Catholic Church, did a lot of things that people were used to. This is the way we've always done it. And then Martin Luther came in and got out his Bible as a part of the Catholic Church, by the way. He wasn't just going out, I'm going to tear this down. He was part of the Catholic Church, but he began to read his Bible. Hmm. And he began to look at it and go, you know, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says something different, and that's what began the Protestant Reformation. What does the Word of God 
said that is so important. And so if someone is doing something different than we would do or different than we would prefer, hello, music style, right? That's always a problem. <laughs> then it doesn't mean that it's wrong. And if it, but if it is in line with scripture where Jesus is exalted as the only way to God through his shed blood, then let's not throw rocks at other people, right? Let's celebrate and enjoy, rejoice that the word of God is going out and that people are coming into the kingdom and that his kingdom is advancing. Okay, so we need to be free from jealousy. And then we need to not be a stumbling block, verse 42. And this is where he says, if anyone causes one of these little ones to, who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. And I remember when I was a kid that uh, this verse scared me because I was like, oh my goodness, what does that mean? And if you don't know what a millstone is, here's a picture of it. That big wheel there is the millstone and you would put grain down in the in the trough there, and the donkey would go round and round and round in circles, and it would turn wheat into flour. But that's a great big heavy thing there, and it's like, wow, Jesus, why are you so strong about that? What is the issue? What he's reminding here is, us is that we as disciples are responsible for those who are young spiritually who are around us, and because of that, we have to really be careful how what we teach and how we live because they can make a huge impact on people we need to take our responsibility to as in influencing other young believers very seriously now paul in his letters talk all about freedom in christ and uh, but in the middle of first corinthians he's asked a question by the corinthian church about food being sacrificed to idols and the question was you know can we eat as believers do we have the freedom to eat food that's been sacrificed to idols, you know, because it's been offered to these gods and everything. And, and Paul basically says, well, an idol is nothing, right? It's just a piece of wood, a piece of metal. It doesn't have any effect on the, 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 the food at all. So you can eat it if you want to. But at the end of that section, he says something really important and relevant to this discussion is, is what he says is, but if I eat meat, what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin. I'll never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall what he's saying here is that we have freedom in some things but we still need to be really careful how we exercise those freedoms people can be led away by something that we're doing even in liberty we need to be willing to give up those rights for the benefit of them so then we go on in this passage we go back to greatness in the kingdom of god deals with personal sin this is verse 43 to 48, and he says, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And then he goes on and says the same thing about your foot and about your eye here. And so, um, obviously, Jesus is, is using hyperbole here. He doesn't mean to literally go and chop off your hand or your foot or poke out your eye. Because, but even if we did, if we thought he was doing, saying that literally, what if you did that? What if you cut off your hands and your feet or took out your eyes? Does that stop you from sin? No, because it, it does sin reside in the members of our body, you know, our hands and our feet. That's not what James says. James says when each, each one is tempted by his own evil desire, he's dragged away and enticed. And then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. And so uh, the evil desire, the motivation for sin is inside of us. It's not our hands and our feet. So uh, if we go back to this verse here, what Jesus is really saying here is we need to be radical in dealing with personal sin. He says, when you identify a sin, cut it off. Get rid of it, no matter how painful it seems or how essential it might seem to your life. I mean, eyes are pretty important, right? Hands and feet are pretty important. But regardless of how deeply that thing that you're holding on to may seem to you, he's saying get rid of it because there's no managing sin. I, I love this quote from Matt Chandler in his book, Recovering Redemption. This is a great, great quote. He says, sin can't be trained. It must be killed. It won't ever just wet on the paper. 
It'll always end up trashing the whole house. The only way to change it is to get rid of it, not go around cleaning up after it or trying to teach it how to mind you. Sorrow comes from treating sin lightly. Change comes from taking sin seriously. So we can't train sin. You can't make it behave. You can't make it do what you want it to. Um, he says, in a sense, uh, that's what Jesus is saying. If it leads you away from him, whatever it is, amputate it, kill it, get rid of it, because the truth is that sin always takes you further than you thought, keeps you longer than you planned, and costs you more than you could ever imagine. You know, it takes you further than you thought. You were just going to do this one thing, and here you take another step, and another step, and another step. You're way down the road further than you ever thought it would be. Keeps you longer than you planned. I was just going to be do this for a little while, and then I'm going to stop it. You hear that all the time. I can stop any time I want to. Yeah, sometimes it gets its tentacles in you, and you can't, right? And then cost you more than you can imagine. This is the whole story of Jacob and Esau, right? Esau went. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm hungry. I'm going to trade my birthright because I'm starving right now. What he didn't realize was in the bargain, he gave up the, the right to have the Son of God come through his family mm -hmm. and be preserved by God. He had no idea that that was going on. Always costs you more than you can imagine. So get rid of it, even if it, it get rid of sin, even if you imagine that it's good for you, and uh, it, because in the long run, it's going to do way more damage than you ever thought it could. And so don't play with it. Don't play with it, ladies. Get it out of your life, and then you'll be more free and alive and stronger because of it. All right, two, uh, two more here, and we get to verse 49. Through greatness, understands the purpose of trials. Now this, everyone will be salted with fire. I had a lot of interpretations when I was studying this, but uh, I kind of bounce back to when every time I see fire, I think of a Isaiah 48.10. That's what comes to my mind, so I kind of went there with it. He says, see, I've refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. So uh, what is the purpose of, for, of refining? Um, if you don't know, it's for getting rid of the impurities in the metal and so the way that they would do it even today is that they heat the metal up to all its molten and the impurities will rise to the top they take a great big bellows and they blow them off and uh the, and that's the way that they would get rid of them and so the metal is pure now here's the really cool thing is back in antiquity a long time ago the way a gold or silversmith would would tell if the impurities is gone is by what he would do is he would look where the metal was molded he would look into that big vat of metal and look for his reflection and if his reflection was clear and sharp he knew the impurities were gone now apply that to our trials. The point is of them, one of the points, is to blow off the impurities from our lives. Just like we were talking about in the last, last verses. And, but the point is to get rid of them so the reflection of the master smith for us is clear and untainted. And applying that to this verse from Mark, Jesus is saying trials come. Remember the purpose of them is to pure, purify and refine us and make our lives a better reflection of Jesus as we become conformed to his image. All right, last one is that true greatness seeks purity for maximum usefulness. Last verse in this chapter, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. And so salt in New Testament days, primarily it was used as a preservative. But you just didn't go to the store and buy a, a container of Morton salt and take it home and use it. Uh, it came from the Dead Sea for them, and it was filled with impurities. And in that form, it was basically useless. They had to get the impurities out of it because in that form, it would pollute everything else that was put on. Put on. So that ties back to that previous verse. And other places, that you know, you probably know Jesus says that we're to be salt of the earth. That is, we're supposed to be a preserving influence on society and uh, influence it for Christ. But that only happens when we are pure and untainted. So he says here, have salt in yourselves. And if you apply uh, the, the idea of preservation here, 
When we lose our ability to, to discern truth from error and to apply it in our lives and to live it out, then when we allow sin in our lives, then we've lost our saltiness. And just like food that doesn't have salt on it back then would develop rotten spots, when we don't apply the, the salt of the word to our lives, we develop rotten spots in our lives as well. That is where the, the word has not, not preserved it. It becomes infected and it becomes it deteriorates. And this, that's when the salt of the truth is gone and we don't apply it. So Jesus is telling his disciples to use humility and service to preserve the, the purity of the church and the unity rather than dividing it uh, with a self-focused desire to be great. And only when we allow the salt of the world word to penetrate our lives and remove those impurities to get rid of sin out of our lives, keeps those rotten spots from developing, then we will ever be useful in the hand of God and ultimately find greatness. Remember, not greatness in the eyes of the world. That may never, ever, ever come, but that's not supposed to be our focus anyway. It's not about seeking for yourself. It's really the opposite of that, complete opposite of that. Setting aside yourself, seeking first his kingdom, his righteousness. And when we do that, we're always going to find what we're really looking for. Amen? Amen. God, we just thank you that um, you speak to every area of our life, Amen. that you give us the invitation and the opportunity to be part of what you're doing on this earth. What an immense privilege. Thank you for opening up your kingdom to us, inviting us in through your son's precious blood. Remind us of how important that is and to help us to lift our eyes off of what we want to do right now and what we're thinking about and our motivations. God, help us to look at you and be drawn toward you so that we can maximize our time here on earth that you've given us so that we can be salt in this world and light to those who don't know your son. It's in his powerful name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.